My, uh, my lords, ladies and gentlemen, a, a very uh, warm welcome. My name's Terry Jones. I'm Director General of the NFU. And on behalf of our office holders, staff, and 55,000 NFU members, a very warm welcome to the Royal Society and this year's Henry Plum Lecture. And a very warm welcome to Lord Plum, who is here this evening with members of his family, as well as his team from the uh, Henry Plum Foundation, a brilliant organisation which helps young people to realise their dream of finding a future career in the farming and food industry. Now, Lord Plum began his career, or his NFU career, as Warwickshire County Chairman uh, in 1952. He became our Vice President in 1964 at the age of 38, and he would go on to serve as President between 1970 and 1978, and is undoubtedly the NFU's most famous former president. Lord Plum has enjoyed a truly unique and hugely varied career, including serving in the European Parliament as its only British president, not to mention being a tireless champion for British farming for 30 years in the House of Lords. Lord Plum's leadership at the NFU, I think, was to take a firm, informed stance after listening to others, and actively seeking a wide range of views to ensure complete understanding of an issue. It was about listening to different perspectives, even when they challenged the NFU's assumptions or received wisdom. So we are therefore very grateful that Lord Plum gave his name to our annual Henry Plum Lectures, which are underpinned by that spirit. Now in its fourth year, and already established as one of the NFU's flagship annual events. The Henry Plum Lecture is a unique opportunity for us to get together with you, our closest stakeholders and partners, and hear from national and now this evening international thought leaders. People who have taken global leadership on issues that touch food and farming, the environment and rural life. And that is why this year I am delighted that the lecture will be delivered by the Most Reverend and Right Honourable Justin Welby, the 105th Archbishop of Canterbury. Whether it's campaigning for trade justice, both abroad and at home, speaking out about coping with mental health, standing up for rural communities and the economic and social challenges they face, or being a key voice in calls that everyone, regardless of income, should be able or have access to good quality sustainable, affordable food. Archbishop Justin has been a p powerful global voice on the questions that matter most uh, to us in this room today. Archbishop, uh, we meet at challenging times for our members at the NFU. The agriculture sector is facing soaring costs and a crippling shortage of workers. British farmers also need to get their heads around new, separate and increasingly divergent agricultural policy regimes for England, Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland. And alongside this, there are the challenges of rural crime, poor connectivity, how we ensure that the government's levelling up agenda reaches rural Britain and the need to tackle the threat of climate change. At the same time, new trade deals, uh, absolutely having the potential to undermine our own high standards. And of course, we are still in a pandemic. And it's therefore no surprise that mental health is a key issue facing farmers and rural communities too. Because of COVID-19, we have this evening been restricted to a smaller and more intimate gathering than usual. Given the profile of our speaker tonight, I think it's quite likely that without these restrictions, the NFU would have needed to feed the 5,000 tonight. We are very lucky to have Archbishop Justin with us to reflect on the role farming communities have to play in his vision for a flourishing 21st century Britain. Please join me in welcoming to the stage Justin Welby, the Archbishop of Canterbury. Thank you very much indeed. It's uh, a great honour to be here, and it's a particular honour to speak in front of Lord Plum. 
uh, who has championed the interests of farmers as well as young people interested in farming on the local, national and international stage. There is, of course, another reason that I'm very glad that Henry, as he kindly said I could call him, uh, is here today. When in, at the European Parliament in Strasbourg, Pope John Paul II was heckled, by Ian Paisley, calling him the Antichrist, as it happened. Uh, Lord Plum, in his position as president, ordered the heckler out of the room. Uh, so I feel comfortable today knowing that he will <laughs> defend me. I did, once, I did once get an email many years ago. Uh, well, no, it wasn't email, it was on, on the internet. Uh, there was something about me from a group in the United States which described me as the deputy antichrist. I'm afraid to say it was the deputy that really offended me. <laughs> it's a real pleasure for all of us, I think, to be in a room seeing people again after such a peculiar time. I've been watching a lot of screens, and one set of screens I'll come back to later. For two hours at lunchtime today and again tomorrow, I was with the uh, vast majority of the leaders of the archbishops who lead the 42 provinces of the Anglican Communion, listening as they went round for this first day, two minutes by two minutes, describing the problems they face. It is worth saying as background to what I'm going on to say, that in the, um, uh, the Anglican Communion is about 85 million people in about, uh, speaking roughly 2,000 languages, in about 165 countries. The average Anglican is a woman who is a farmer in the Global South, subsistence farming on less than $4 a day, and with a 50-50 chance of being in a zone of persecution, conflict, or immediate post-conflict. The Anglican Church worldwide is a church mainly of farmers, and those were the stories I was hearing today. But also, I've been watching another screen. I'm afraid, you may groan if you wish to at this point, or cheer, I got into watching Clarkson's Farm over the last 18 months. I, I have no idea how you feel about it or how farmers do generally. Maybe for you, watching Jeremy Clarkson feels a bit like me watching anything with a vicar in it. Either you can't stand it or you get completely addicted. I generally find depictions of vicars on TV to be depressing. They're portrayed either as rogues or idiots. Like farmers, the reality is very different. It is actually of hard-working, normal people caring deeply about what they do and working all their hours that are to do it. But I take away from Clarkson's Farm not just how much I enjoy watching it, but how hard, extraordinarily stressful and deeply complicated and scientific farming and agriculture is. Additionally, I am deepened in my wonder at the natural world, at the natural land. Wonder which has been there throughout my life. Uh, my mother was brought up by another, by a friend of Lord Plum's and someone else involved in farming called Richard Butler, uh, who was her first cousin. And uh, I spent much of my childhood, which for various reasons was a bit odd, uh, up on, on the North Norfolk coast with my grandmother in an agriculture and obviously mainly arable area. I was a rural vicar for seven years. And as Bishop of the Diocese of Canterbury, where I serve, not most of the time, but certainly as much as I can get down there, I spend my time as yesterday in rural areas and rural villages, rural parish churches. But the wonder of the land, it seems to me to be set out beautifully in the book of Job, slightly unlikely. Job in the Old Testament 
is someone who is facing disaster. His family have been killed by raiders, his cattle have been stolen, his crops have been destroyed, and his house has been leveled. And he is, not surprisingly, a little cross about this, and is saying to God, what do you think you're up to? And God says, at the end of 38 chapters of Job, saying, what do you think you're up to? And Job's friend saying, it must be your fault, Job, or these bad things wouldn't happen to you. God says to him, when he puts the question to God, when God appears, ask the animals and they will teach you, or the birds in the sky and they will tell you, or speak to the earth and it will teach you, or let the fish in the sea inform you. Which of all these does not know that the hand of the Lord has done this? In his hand is the life of every creature and the breath of all mankind. And those words, in one sense, sum up the beauty that people experience and the extraordinary nature of farming as it has developed and continues to develop. But, as you just said, the farming community has faced many challenges of its own over the past years, and they are getting more difficult. If you look at neurological sciences, at neurosciences, and for various reasons in the summer while I was on sabbatical, I was studying some of this, the neuroscientists say that the chemistry of the brain is most adversely affected by uncertainty, by sustained adversity, and by the inability to control events. Does that not sum up farming to a, a great deal at the moment. The challenges are both good and bad. Farmers are facing them globally, nationally, and locally, and they are both immediate and longer term. In reality, as we all know, we haven't yet begun to see the impact of COVID, COVID or the fallout on the new trend to working from home. Certainly in, this, in London, uh, you will find that offices are in a completely different state to where they were two and a half years ago. Our own offices uh, for, the ch for Church House, where the administration is run, often are operating at no more than 30% uh, capacity. The rest of the people are working and working well, but they're working from home. People are saving huge sums of money by not commuting. They are trying to improve their lifestyle and their quality of life by moving into rural areas. In an area that Caroline and I know well in France, we heard this summer that for the first time in two generations, house prices are moving up. They don't move at all in France, but they're moving up because people are moving out of the cities because they can now work effectively from home and only go into their offices occasionally. There will be different working patterns and there will even be different ideas about how and where we should live at the deepest levels. For farming communities and rural communities, some of these will be a threat and others will be a huge help and improvement. Most villages in the country would love the idea of some young families moving in, of shops reopening, of there being a school closer, of all the things that go with a flourishing all-age community. Throughout the pandemic, however, it's been shown that communities the size of rural communities flourish. Villages did extremely well in comparison to urban areas unsurprisingly, because farmers and farming communities are like this, in terms of community health and help and weathering the pandemic. They are wonderful places for people to live and they can have, and I believe they really can have, an exciting future of which I hope the church can be and is called to be and ought to be at the heart. Community the living in abundant and flourishing communities is clearly the key to unlocking the potential of the future. 
Community means living in places where you can build relationships that enable us to support and encourage one another during difficult times and celebrate and empower one another in better times. When I was in my two rural parishes, one was a small market town, the other was a small village, the, um, uh, the local church in the village had a churchyard wall that was falling down, nothing very unusual about that. And I was muttering to one of the local farmers after a service as we looked at the wall crumbling into the road about the amount of paperwork I'd have to do in order to get what is known in church circles as a faculty in order to get permission to repair a wall that was perfectly easy to repair and it would add thousands to the cost because they would insist it was done in a certain way. And he looked at me and said, I wouldn't worry about that. Just leave the paperwork for a few weeks. So I did. I was sensible enough. A few weeks later, the wall was somehow all in one piece. <laughs> and I said, Jack, um, the wall seems to have miraculously reassembled itself. And he said, oh, I think the fairies did it. <laughs> so I gave him a very level look, six foot four of him. But they'd obviously got together with some other farmers and they'd spent half a day just sorting it out. Farming, agricultural, rural communities think it normal to help out and to help one another out. They are good communities. But... As the dust begins to settle, we know that we are in a time of unprecedented change. And I'm very against the word unprecedented, but it is happening. And that change has been wildly accelerated by the pandemic. We have seen changes in, for instance, the capacity to develop vaccines that scientists did not expect for decades but which have been brought about by the decoding of, the, of DNA and the capacity to decode what is going on in the vaccine by a computer power that enables the modeling of new treatments to come at accelerated rates. We are going to face autonomous forms of transport. They are now practical, just about, provided you don't mind when you're driving down a motorway at 80 miles an hour, switching everything off, waiting 30 seconds, and switching it on again, as we have to do with our computers the whole time. It does seem to me to be a drawback if we ever get autonomous aircraft. <laughs> but I suppose they will probably solve that, and we will think in 10 years, but it'll probably be three. But changes which at the turn of the millennium seemed like science fiction. Artificial intelligence, machine learning are advancing rapidly. It raises existential questions for people regarding their identity, their purpose, and what it means to be human. Communications are genuinely unrecognizable, hugely powerful and immensely subversive of existing orders and structures of many societies and institutions. You may have heard that it looks as though in Sudan there will be a return to civilian government after the military coup of a few weeks ago. One of the reasons for that is that they have found it virtually impossible to shut the military government to shut down mobile telephony sufficiently to stop people coordinating opposition from within the country. That, in the past... All you needed to do was capture the radio and television station, secure the army's support, and appear on the television saying, I'm the new president. Nowadays, it's virtually impossible. But all these changes are very unequally distributed. Going round the world today, hearing from the archbishops area after area, it was predictable. Canada... Well, we've reached about 80% of vaccination, or a bit more. But there is, we've got a big problem with anti-vaxxers. United States, similar. Uh, even countries like Mexico, similar. Sudan, South Sudan, around 
around 2%. And some countries, they didn't know anyone who'd got the vaccine. These inequalities are not only a profoundly moral failure, they are also a logistical failure, and they are also a failure of imagination, because as the head of the World Health Organization says everywhere, this will not be defeated anywhere till it's defeated everywhere. Medicine is advancing, as I said, ever more rapidly. Social tensions are growing as traditional societies and structures either resist or seek to adapt to change. Look at the riots in, in places like Holland, the use of live ammunition in a riot on Saturday. For most of us, including the farming community, the impact of these changes will be revolutionary for the jobs, for development, for life expectancy, and for life quality. And, of course, above all that and over all that, there is the threat of climate change. The Archbishop of South Sudan, at about quarter to one today, he said, roughly half my country is underwater. Half my country is underwater. What will that do to the farmers there who are subsistence farmers on whom getting the crops in depends on whether they eat or die over the next 12 months? And climate change will not only define our livelihoods, but the lives of every single one of us, our descendants, if rapid action is not taken. But change, as we know, as the NFU has shown over many, many years, when we joined the European Union, or common market as it was then, and now, farmers have always been those who are able to adapt to change, and that means opportunity if we seize it, shape it, and mold it. The past 20 months have shown us to be aware of the connections that we didn't always see, but are vital to our communities. It's taught us that our welfare is dependent on our neighbor. None of us lives and dies for themselves alone. There's an expression in Southern Africa that I was taught by Archbishop Tutu, he who stood up and uh, fought the apartheid regime so extraordinarily without drawing a weapon. He said, we believe in something called Ubuntu. Ubuntu is a, a word that is, it's a concept that essentially means I exist only because I'm in relationship with you. We are interconnected. And we're interconnected on a global as well as a local scale, as farmers know well, from what happens when new sources of crops come from far away at great carbon cost and undermine local markets. No one over the last few months here will have failed to notice the implications of some of the things that happened over the past few years, few months even. Concerns about supply lines. You've mentioned absence of labor. And it's affecting so many people. And worries about food prices. Those worries, of course, come at both ends of the supply chain. Farmers are worried about food prices for good and sufficient reason, that they can't get enough money to make it worthwhile keeping on producing. And the lower paid, the working poor, are worried about food prices because they find themselves going to food banks. And it means that people are beginning to know what goes into things we took previously for granted and expected to show up magically on our shelves and tables, supplied by the same fairies that mended my churchyard wall. In the last few months, we have peeled back the skin of our society, and we have found that inequality and injustice has made a home in our country. But we have also paid tribute to the hard-working people who keep it going. 
This is an obvious statement with which I'm sure you will agree, but during the pandemic, we saw firsthand that farmers are key workers. We saw how precious and valuable their work is and how we need to look after them as we emerge from the pandemic. I will say again and again in this lecture that the first job of farming is to produce food. And when it fails to do that, we are all in trouble. That is why we are not in the position of South Sudan, because farmers here produce food adequately, brilliantly, hardworkingly, and against the odds year after year. So within that, a few words about some of the challenges that farmers face. I'm going to talk particularly about mental health and health and safety, isolation and deprivation. It's a very tough time for many involved in farming. The Farm Safety Foundation ran a survey which found that 88% of farmers cite poor mental health as the biggest hidden problem facing the industry, an issue that will only have been exacerbated by the pandemic and shows no sign of abating. Someone like Jeremy Clarkson is okay because he's surrounded by people who are filming him. He's got people he can talk to. He has the extraordinary Caleb and other people like that who tells him to do things that probably as Archbishop of Canterbury I shouldn't repeat. The ONS reported that in 2019-20, before the pandemic, 133 people working in farming and agricultural trades took their own lives. Health and safety is, is a real issue. Agriculture has the worst rate of fatal injuries of all the major industrial sectors, 20 times higher than the average five-year annual rate. In the last 10 years, one person a week has been killed as a direct result of agricultural work. Many more have been seriously injured or made ill by their work. Just over one in a hundred workers work in agriculture, but it accounts for about one in five fatal injuries to workers. We know rural communities face isolation and serious deprivation. We know that the number of families categorized as homeless in rural local authorities has risen to almost 20,000 a 115% increase on 2017 to 18. The storms they have weathered over the last few years have been deep and extraordinarily painful. And now we are at a juncture and the future can go two ways. Will we treasure and support our farmers, provide them access to good health care, especially mental health care, bolster community support, campaign strongly for education, equipment and legislation that enables farmers to do their jobs safely and profitably. The biggest lesson I've learned from 40 years working, including in the oil industry and running bits and pieces of the church from local parishes for many years through an NGO working in conflict around the world to now in the Church of England nationally and internationally, is Macorba's lesson, that if you have a pound more going out than coming in, the result is misery. And if it's the other way round, the result is happiness. And Mr. Macorba's great mistake was today, something will turn up, because it doesn't always. So profitable farming is a serious foundation of effective farming. It is necessary. Will our rural areas be active, lively places where the future will happen full of energy and innovation? Most of the Church of England schools are, I can never get the, the thousands right, I think it's 4,700 or something like that, with roughly a million children in them. The vast majority are in rural areas. They're small rural schools, often with 40, 50, 60, 70, 100 people in them, one class of entry. We cannot keep them open unless government is prepared to pay the costs of keeping rural schools open. 
But if you lose your school, you lose one of the main areas of support for the community. You lose the opportunity to get young families to move into the country and educate their children. It makes them harder. It makes it harder for them to start farming or to work in agriculture. Or will, if, they are not air, if rural areas are not active, lively places, full of energy and innovation, will they just be areas of rest and recreation, preserved in aspic for those who are able to afford it? I have nothing against rest and recreation before anyone jumps at me and say, Archbishop is a workaholic. If there was a, an Olympic sport in sleeping, I would be a gold medalist. <laughs> but I have everything against traditions that preserve any institution, church or any other, in some mythical golden age of the past and expect it to flourish. So we, are we going to face the challenge and build the opportunity? We're looking at a bold, exciting vision of Britain, if we are, a vision fit for the 21st century and beyond. And farming, I believe, will be the backbone of such a vision of a successful country. And that's for four reasons, all of them linked. First, our heritage and communities. As we look towards who and what we want to be as a nation, we need to have a strong foundation of where we've come from, who we are, and how we live together. I was talking at Glasgow to someone I'd met on Zoom many times, uh, an indigenous Australian, Aboriginal Australian, called Pastor Ray. He's the seventh generation of his family to be a pastor. He's Anglican, working out with his people, going walkabout, meeting them right out in the bush in Australia. And... Uh, it's where he mentioned to me once that it was only in 1967 that the Australian Constitution was changed to recognise Aboriginal people as human beings. Before that, they were not recognised in the Constitution as humans. And he said one of the sayings of his people, his particular clan in Australia, is we walk backwards into the future. In other words, we keep our eye on what we've been. We hold on to our traditions. We preserve what is good, but we go into the future. And I said, why do you not look forwards? He said, we have no view of the future. None of us knows what the future is. We can't look forward. We're blind. But when we look back, we can see a huge distance. And that gives us a way of navigating the blindness of what is coming. So if we're going to preserve our heritage and uh, our communities, we have to build and support rural communities which flourish, which serve every generation with access to services and opportunities that unlock people's potential and bring people together. I'll come to that again in a moment. Secondly, there has to be a reliable source of nutritious food available to everyone, and that is indispensable. It must be an integral part of government policy at every level. I do not believe that we can have successful rural communities if the first priority is anything other than producing food. Of course it has to be done sustainably, but it has to be done. Third, the climate. And I have said, and it's not controversial anymore, that climate change is the biggest threat we face, one that will not become a threat but a fate if we don't do something about it quickly. The government has committed to net zero by 2050. The Church of England has gone a couple of steps, fur steps further and said all our buildings, property, plants, and equipment nationally, including churches and schools, will be net zero by 2030. The NFU has a 2040 target. Net zero cannot happen in this country without the farming community. 
And fourth, and finally, our relationship, not finally in this lecture, bad luck, <laughs> our relationship with the rest of the world, our trade deals, and how we show leadership on the global stage has to be clear and expressed and implemented carefully and thoughtfully. In a post-Brexit era, in a time of globalization, our farming communities can and do lead the way on food standards, animal welfare, trade and exports that make people's lives better and more prosperous around the world. We have a knowledge base which is exportable. You are the knowledge base that is exportable. And if we forget about that in our trade deals, we abandon one of the greatest sources of this country's strength, especially in international commerce. These are the challenges and opportunities on a very macro scale, where those involved in farming and agriculture have a real role to play. So how do we get there? How do we get from where we are now to this vision of rural communities as lively, flourishing, exciting, prosperous, innovative places to live and work? Many of the answers, I, I suggest, lie in traditioned innovation in rural communities. And that has to happen in a number of key areas. Food production, housing, community generation through churches, schools, and other community hubs, communication infrastructure and adaptability to new science and education, and training in and adoption of new technology which is sustainable and economically viable. I spoke of change earlier. It's something we're all experiencing. Farming change, change in the church, change unsettles. Jesus spoke of being worried about the future in one of his parables. Uh, by the way, I do apologise in advance. There will be quite a lot of Jesus in this lecture because I'm the Archbishop of Canterbury and it's sort of my job. The thing about the parables is that many of them are agricultural because that's community Jesus, the community Jesus lived in. The Bible is full of rich language about our relationship with the land and good fertile land is synonymous in the Bible with a good life and blessing. You could say that understanding farming helps you understand the Bible. In this parable, Luke 12, 16 to 34, a man wonders what to do with his bountiful harvest. He builds bigger barns. He decides he's going to retire, put up his feet and take life easy. And God tells him, do not keep striving for what you're to eat and what you're to drink. And do not keep worrying. For it is the nations of the world that strive after all these things, and your Father knows that you need them. Instead, strive for his kingdom, and these things will be given to you as well. I'm going to resist the urge to go off on an expository sermon about that passage, but simply to say what Jesus is saying is a proper attitude to the future, a proper attitude to God, and a proper attitude to the mor morality of how we live is the necessary foundation to life working properly. God's response is to tell us not to worry, not because if you're a Christian then everything goes absolutely perfectly all the time. I know myself that's not the case, but because we can have faith in something bigger and we're not alone on the journey. God is not just a God of Sunday mornings in the church pews, but of everything. So what is a vision for the future? What's a vision that is God's vision for human future look like in relation to farming? Three particular areas, justice, value, and relationship. I spoke of five areas of tradition and innovation, food production, housing, community regeneration, communi communication infrastructure, and new technology training. And I think they roughly fit under three broader uh, categories. And these are value, justice, and relationship. Value. There is inherent good, inherent value, inherent worth in our land, our livestock, our crops, and in ourselves. 
In that parable, we read Jesus saying, life is more than food, the body more than clothing. Consider the ravens, they neither sow nor reap, and yet God feeds them. Consider the lilies, how they grow. Even Solomon, in all his glory, was not clothed like one of these. The basic things matter to God, the Bible tells us. The food we eat, the people who get it on our tables matter. They're not a natural resource. They are people with inherent dignity. I've seen headlines recently about farmers having to slaughter pigs because of labor shortages. This is the exact opposite of the inherent dignity the best of farmers, which is most of farmers, give to their land and their livestock and to the value of what they do. And it is not treating livestock with the value of something created by the creator. We need to pay fair prices for work and fair prices for produce. Justice. When you appreciate the value of things, you want them to be treated fairly. You hunger for justice. Food justice is a major issue. Everyone should be able to afford good, nutritious, healthy, sustainable food. Schools should supply it obtained in the UK as part of our normal education in healthy living. Why are school meals voluntary if we want children to learn about nutrition? In Sweden, they're part of the mainline curriculum so that people are taught what healthy eating is about. Why is it that we've gone back to paying the same amount for school meals, or the budget is the same amount for school meals with many people, with many companies who supply them, as it was before Jamie Oliver started his campaign when it went up fourfold and it's gone back down. One thing that was absolutely clear about COVID was the risk of underlying health issues and especially obesity, says he pulling in his stomach. Cost of diabetes by 2025 will outweigh the cost of cancer treatment. How we live and what we eat is absolutely vital to our welfare, to our health, and the health of the NHS in perpetuity. Therefore, we should teach it. Isn't that pretty obvious? Secondly, the need for labour justice. The seasonal and agricultural workers who contribute so much to this industry deserve to be treated fairly, but as you know better than I do, it's an area ripe for exploitation. The Clewer Initiative is a partner of the Church of England, working within all 42 of our dioceses where it seeks to combat modern slavery in all its forms. They've developed an app, the Farm Work Welfare app, you may like to look it up, to help combat labour exploitation and modern slavery in the rural and fresh food produce supply chains, where people, businesses, locals or workers can flag concerns or seek help if they suspect exploitation. The app educates workers about their rights and provides farmers and growers with information and tools to combat this evil. Climate justice. We've all already mentioned, I've already mentioned the net zero commitments. We still need to learn to eat locally, seasonally, and more consciously. We need to cut food waste. Food waste costs over £19 billion a year in the UK, emitting 25 million tonnes of greenhouse gas. We need to develop and adapt new technology and take advantage to produce renewable energy. Some fascinating scientific developments are pointing us towards more climate-friendly and efficient production, like technology that monitors closely the nitrogen content of soil, or genome editing, which can increase the efficiency of cow's milk production. Science is not a threat when it is held within a moral framework. And economic justice for rural areas. This includes the need for housing, which is affordable. Education centres, schools, broadband, and other opportunities to learn to do business. Earlier this year, the Archbishop's Commission on Housing, Church and Community, set up by myself and Stephen Cottrell, the Archbishop of York, issued their report. They focused on the vital importance of building 
not just housing, but community, and looked at how church lands might be used for the provision of affordable homes. They looked at a one case study, Keswick Community Housing Trust in the Lake District, where local people were living in substandard housing with unaffordable rents or being forced to commute long distances while property prices skyrocketed, being sold as second homes or holiday lets. In that situation, the church worked with partners to form a community land trust to af provide affordable homes in perpetuity and affordable according to local earnings, not market rates, which has been the historic error in defining affordability. If someone said, varied the old saying about anyone can, um, uh, the Ritz is open to anyone, provided you can pay the price for the meal. And they said, we're going to have an affordable Ritz and the price will be 75% of the non-affordable Ritz. 90% of the population still couldn't go. Prices have to be set in relation to earnings. Research from English Rural, which is a non-profit housing association in rural communities, which has partnered with us on multiple projects, suggests that investing in affordable rural housing is key if we want to level up and turbocharge the rural economy. And we've not yet even begin, begun to feel the fallout of population moves from the pandemic and high cost of living in the cities. And that leads me on to the urban-rural relationship. We need to encourage urban communities, we've been saying this forever, so I'll be quick about it, to understand better the value rural Britain offers. The challenges that are faced, what's behind the food on their plates. But it's not just urban-rural relationships that need support. The lack of social interaction recently has taken its toll on so many. For rural communities where village shows and livestock markets are so often a chance to chat and interact with others, the loss of this time has been really, really difficult. To have flourishing communities and community generation, you need something that provides life and health within that community. Churches, I really mean that, and we're not closing them down, we're opening them faster than we're closing them, Further schools, FE colleges, businesses, skills development. All these needed to be supported and accessible to local communities. 65% of Church of England churches, 66% of our parishes are in rural areas. The Church of England has agricultural chaplains and has just appointed a first hedgerow chaplain. I found that out. Um, but I haven't quite found out what they do. <laughs> but I will. I want to take this opportunity to say that the local church is there for everyone in the parish, whether they're a churchgoer or not, and are intimately bound up, bound up in the community. This is a challenge for the church as we seek to ensure that they flourish and support local communities. We need to change in the Church of England to reclaim the vision of being not only the Church of England, but also the Church for England, every part, rural and urban. And we can't do that by spreading clergy more thinly. When we're unable to be face to face, rural communities need proper communications infrastructure. During the pandemic, Wi-Fi went from being a luxury for some to a necessity for all, and especially for business in the countryside, which includes farms. A communications infrastructure company called Weispire, founded by the Diocese of Norfolk, aims to provide better broadband services to rural areas using parish church tires, amongst other things, to deliver high-speed wireless internet access. So that's relationship and community at home. But farming communities also need to be on the forefront as we forge new and maintain current relationships abroad. Making the most of the overseas market post-Brexit is crucial. We need to get our trade deals right to protect the world-class British standards of farming. Bad deals 
risk exporting environmental and animal welfare harms and destroying farmers' livelihoods. You mentioned that earlier. I hope that that lesson has gone home. It needs to be reminded of regularly. Government needs to partner with farmers to build global ambition and to increase the British food brand identity across the world to grow global markets. The new Agriculture Act means there is an opportunity for British farming to become a leader in sustainable and climate-friendly, but above all, highly sustainable and, highly and high standard food production. So to conclude, the reach of the NFU is not just in the local communities and the farmers it represents, it's global. We have to harness the challenges we're facing from the local to the global and transform them into opportunities. I say that, but it's, of course, as you know as well as I do, much harder to do than to say. I remember when I was in the oil industry, my boss got into saying, there is no such thing as a problem. There is only an opportunity. Until one of my colleagues said in a meeting, John... On this issue, we're facing an insurmountable opportunity. <laughs> I am well aware that there are real problems. But to grow, you don't make sharp turns. I believe you do progressive change embedded in virtues and traditions. You walk backwards into the future. You do it through relationships, not policy or large radical changes, but by knowing people, by nudging and suggesting and winning consensus. Both the church and the farmers have been in this country for, for centuries, one and a half millennia in our case, a multiple of that in farming's case. And we plan, God willing, to be here for centuries more. But if we want to be a leader in the 21st century, we need to take a leaf out of the farming community's book. Adaptability, resilience, and above all, hope and a bit of faith. God tells us that he is with us in all seasons, of feasting, of fasting, of sowing, of reaping, and in fallow times. We can put down firm roots in values and communities, and those roots enable us to be resilient and flexible when storms come. They are what will help us, the country, our farming communities, and the church, to be ambitious and innovative as times change. That way, we can ensure we fulfill our potential and flourish together as the farming industry cares for our well-being, our environment, and our economy for many years to come. Thank you. <laughs>